Hi you guys, um, today we are going to be reading The Volcano That Changed the World. This is in your StoryWorks magazine, so go ahead and find that. It should be in your reading folder, and this starts on page four. Just like we do in class, I'm going to be reading it out loud to you so you can just follow along um, in your magazine. Okay, The Volcano That Changed the World. Ten-year-old John Hoisington stared in shock out the window of his family's Vermont farmhouse. It was June 8, 1816. Summer was just two weeks away, yet outside, a wild winter snowstorm was raging. Nearly a foot of snow covered the fields the family had planted only weeks before. The family's vegetable garden was buried. The apple and pear trees shivered in the freezing wind, their delicate buds coated with ice. Like most people in 1816, the Hoisingtons grew almost everything they ate. Practically every bite of the family's food came from the farm, from the corn in their morning, morning porridge to the chicken and potatoes in the suppertime stew. John saw the look of fear in his father's eyes as they watched the snow swirling outside. This storm would kill all of their crops. There would be little food for the, for the family or their animals. How would they survive? What John and his family didn't know was that during that strange summer of 1816, similar weather disasters were unfolding throughout New England and the world. Snow destroyed thousands of other East Coast farms from Virginia up to Maine. Snowstorms and floods struck France, England, Ireland, and Switzerland. There were droughts and floods in India. And there were droughts and floods in India and killing frosts across northern China. At the time, people struggled to understand what had caused the weather to change so wildly. Were witches to blame? It is only now, more than 200 years later, that scientists have finally solved the mystery. Very likely, John Hoisington and his family would have been astonished to learn the truth. The cause of their family's suffering was an event that took place a year earlier and 10,000 miles away from their farm. It all started with a volcano called Mount Tambora. A Ruined Land Mount Tambora sits on the island of Sumbawa, which today is part of the nation of Indonesia. In 1815, perhaps 50,000 people lived, in, lived on Sumbawa, a beautiful land of rushing streams, gentle hills, and thick jungles. Looming over the northern side of the island was Mount Tambora, a quiet mountain dotted with villages and rice farms. Nobody had any reason to suspect that the peaceful mountain was in fact a volcano, that underneath its velvety green slopes were snaking tunnels filled with lava and explosive gases. Like many volcanoes, Tambora looked like an ordinary mountain and had been dormant, asleep, for centuries. But on April 5th, 1815, Tambora woke up. Think about, you guys, um... Another story that we read earlier this year, remember um, Pompeii and Mount Vesuvius? The people also thought that the volcano Mount Vesuvius was um, just a mountain in the distance, so no one was really worried about it either. But if you remember, it caused a lot of destruction. The first eruption shook the island and sent up great plumes of fire and ash, but that was nothing compared with what would come five days later on April 10th. Kaboom! The volcano exploded with terrible fury, spewing out great towers of fire. A tremendous cloud of gas and ash shot high into the sky. The day turned midnight black, but the mountain glowed red as rivers of lava gushed down the slopes. The eruption went on for more than three days, a deadly storm of fire, gas, ash, and rock. In the eruption's terrifying final stage, a wave of flames and gases swept down the mountain at speeds of 400 miles per hour. This pyroclastic surge devastated everything in its path. Okay, we are on the section called Ignored and Forgotten. If you are listening to this on 
um, Wednesday, this is where we're going to stop for today. If you are tuning in for Wednesday, this is where we are picking up. We are on page um, seven. We are at the section ignored and forgotten. The eruption instantly killed at least 12,000 people living on and around Mount Tambora. Ash and lava ruined the island's soil and poisoned its rivers and streams. Rice paddies were destroyed. No fruits or vegetables would grow. There were no fish to catch. Almost every animal had been killed. Trapped without food on their ruined lands, more than 90,000 people on Sambawa and the nearby island of Lombok slowly starved to death. The eruption of Tambora in 1815 was the deadliest and most powerful volcanic eruption in human history. Its explosive energy was 10 times stronger than that of Krakatau, history's most famous volcano, which erupted in 1883, also in what is now Indonesia. And yet, incredibly, few people outside the blast zone learned about this terrible disaster. News and information traveled very slowly in 1815. The only way to get a letter or a person across oceans was on a sailing ship. The voyage from Zimbabwe to New York or London would have taken perhaps four months. So think about why people didn't learn about this, the eruption of Mount Tambora. At that time, in the year 1815, we didn't have phones to call, like cell phones to call each other. You couldn't just text each other or email each other, or you couldn't turn on a TV to watch the news about it. The only way to get message like this to other people across the world would be to be sending um, a letter. And so many people, like John Hoisington's family, would not have known about this volcano erupting across the world. Eventually, reports of the eruption did make it overseas, but few people paid attention. Somehow, the deadliest volcano in history was ignored by most of the world, and then forgotten. What people were paying attention to a year later in 1816 was the terrible weather, snowstorms in the summer, floods that turned wheat fields into lakes, frost that blackened millions of acres of farmland around the world. Farmers up and down the East Coast lost their crops. In Europe, farmers grew desperate. In Paris, mobs of people broke into warehouses where grain was stored, risking their lives to steal sacks of flour. In China, starving families could no longer feed their children. Floods in India triggered an outbreak of disease called cholera, which killed millions. All right, take a look, you guys, at the map on page 8. You can see on the left side of the map is the United States. Um, New England is on the eastern side of the United States. You can see there's an arrow pointing to it. That is where um, John, the character in the story, lived with his family on the farm where it was. there were snowstorms going on in the summer. Imagine that. And then you can see on the right side of the map, there's a little dot from Mount Tambora, Indonesia. So it's all the way on the other side of the world where the volcano erupted, but you can see all these other places in Europe and India and the United States and even the Arctic regions up north, how this volcano affected almost the whole world pretty much. Okay, we are on solving a mystery. In 1816, not even the most brilliant silent, not even the most brilliant scientists would have believed that these weather problems were somehow connected, that all these disasters had been caused by the eruption of a volcano few had heard of. Little was known about climate or volcanoes, but today scientists know that volcanoes can have a major impact on weather worldwide. They have learned by studying recent volcanic eruptions like Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines. 
Scientists monitored every phase of Pinatubo's eruption in June 1991. It was not as powerful as Tambora's, but the eruption was still monstrous, one of the most powerful since Krak Krakatau. Using satellites and computers, scientists tracked the volcano's huge eruption cloud as it rose into the sky. Most volcanic clouds quickly break apart and fade away. But in a very powerful eruption, the cloud rises so high that it mixes with water and other gases in the stratosphere. It turns into a foam and remains high in the sky. Scientists observed Pinatubo, Pinatubo's cloud as it spread across the world. Like a layer of sunscreen slathered across the sky, the cloud blocked out some of the sun's heat and light. Temperatures dropped and storms became more violent. It took three years for Pinatubo's foamy haze to clear. Tambora's cloud would have been even bigger, its effects more devastating. Indeed, like an invisible beast, Tambora's cloud hovered in the sky for about three years. By the time the climate returned to normal, as many as 30 million people had died from Tambora's effects, and many more lives, like the Hoisingtons, had been forever changed. John and his family survived the loss of their crops, but they gave up their farm and moved west to Ohio. They started their trek in June 1817, traveling in an ox cart piled with their possessions. Tens of thousands of other New England farmers made similar journeys, all driven west by the hardship of 1816. It was one of the biggest migrations in U.S. history. Most migrations went to Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. The Hoisington's 1,000-mile journey took three months. John's older sister, Sabrina, recorded the trip in her diary. She described the family's meeting with native people, long days of slogging through mud, and some enjoyable visits with friends they met along the way. They arrived in Ohio in August and were soon settled into life on their new farm. Meanwhile, 10,000 miles away, the volcano that had nearly destroyed their lives went back to sleep, sitting in silence to this day, until it wakes again. Okay. So take a look at the picture at the bottom of page nine. There's Mount Tambora today. So it's now um, dormant, which means it's um, not active. It hasn't erupted again. Um, so to kind of summarize what they were saying in Solving a Mystery, it sounds like um, the eruption was so big that the cloud from the eruption rose so high it, it went up into the stratosphere. Um, it says it was like a layer of sunscreen slathered across the sky that blocked out some of the sun's heat and light. And that's what caused temperatures to drop and storms became more violent. And it, then it said it took three years for things to go back to normal, the climate to go back to normal. And so during that time, people like John, whose family depended on their family farm, had to change it drastically because they were no longer able to grow. Their crops probably weren't able to grow, and um, that would probably have been the way that they fed their family or maybe even made money for the family. So it said that many families had to migrate, which means move to another place. And so they moved um, farther west in the United States. They then said they came to our state of Illinois. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed reading this story and we will be talking about it later on Zoom together. Thanks for listening.